Back in the before time, the long, long ago of 1999, there was one console that lots of critics agreed was the best. It was revolutionary, both in its graphics capacity and its big catalog filled with groundbreaking original games. It was called the Sega Dreamcast. When it launched at the end of the millennium, the Dreamcast was far ahead of its peers, featuring twice the graphical and CPU power of the PlayStation and Nintendo 64, and a built-in modem for online gaming, which was unheard of at the time. The Dreamcast was the console of the future. As one Boston Globe journalist wrote at the time, the hottest computer at my house isn't the homemade box I usually work on or the old Pentium 90 Linux server, it's the new Sega Dreamcast a limited and in some ways rather crude machine which nevertheless could teach any PC a thing or two about serving up realistic, razor sharp electronic entertainment. But a year and a half after it launched in the US, the Dreamcast was dead. This is the story of its rise and fall. Let's start from the beginning. In 1997, Sega was looking to rebound from the disaster that was the Sega Saturn. The successor to the wildly popular Genesis, the Saturn was released in Japan in 1994. It was a CD-ROM console that displayed some pretty impressive graphics, but it had a problem. It was a pain in the ass to develop for. Its complex architecture made it more difficult to program for than its chief competitor, Sony's PlayStation. The Saturn went on to sell only 9.2 million units worldwide. It was, in short, a financial disaster for Sega. The game maker had to do something dramatic to turn things around as it got started on its next console, the Dreamcast. Sega couldn't afford another bad console and, to make things worse, there was a big threat looming on the horizon, the PlayStation 2. Pretty much everyone expected the PS2 to be successful and from the beginning, Sega knew the clock was ticking. But Sega had an answer to its problems, Bernie Stoller. Stoller was a game industry veteran, and before Sega hired him as president of Sega of America, he had been the president of Sony Computer Entertainment America, aka the company that had been kicking Sega's ass. In an interview with Gama Sutra, Stoller said he had to do one thing, get gamers to trust Sega again. Actually, make that two things, he needed retailers to trust Sega again too. We had to change the attitude of retail to believe we were a serious player, Stoller said. And because of the whole Saturn thing, retailers really hated Sega. Why did retailers hate Sega so much? That dated back to the first E3 in Los Angeles in 1995. In his presentation for the upcoming Saturn, Sega of America CEO Tom Kalinske said that due to demand, Sega had already shipped 30,000 Saturns to Toys R Us, Babbage's, Electronics Boutique, and Software Etc. That announcement pissed off retailers who didn't know about the surprise release, including Best Buy, Walmart, and KB Toys, some of whom completely dropped Sega from their lineups. To mend fences for the upcoming Dreamcast, Stoller visited as many retailers as he could. He told Gama Sutra, it took me a lot of work to change their minds. I went to every retailer and told them this was going to be a great system. It was going to have a modem. It was going to have online play. This was the content it was going to have, and this is what it was going to look like. They all bought into that. They all trusted me. For the Dreamcast, Sega was committed to learning the lessons of the Saturn. First up was its hardware. In contrast to the Saturn, the Dreamcast was built with cheaper, off-the-shelf components that meant the new console would be easier to develop games for. And then there was the modem, which would be the first for any console out of the box. Sega chairman Isao Okawa decided to include a modem with every Dreamcast, even though there was significant opposition internally because a modem added an extra $15 for each unit. The Dreamcast first launched in Japan on November 27, 1998. It wouldn't come to the US, Europe, or Australia until almost a full year later, a delay that many would later say cost the Dreamcast valuable time to get a proper foothold. Initially, interest was good in Japan and attracted a lot of pre-orders. It looked like Sega was finally back and it could put the nightmare of Saturn behind it. But almost from the beginning, there were problems. Sega initially said that the latest game in its trademark franchise, Sonic Adventure, would be available at launch. That didn't happen. And due to a manufacturing problem, Sega had a shortage of chipsets for the Dreamcast, which meant it had to stop pre-orders in Japan. When the Dreamcast launched, its entire stock had been sold out. Later, the company estimated that it could have sold another 200,000 to 300,000 units 
in Japan, if only they'd had enough supply. By February of 1999, Sega had sold less than 900,000 units in Japan despite its own goal of over a million. That was a problem considering Sega wanted to get out to a fast start in order to build up a big base of gamers before Sony came out with its PlayStation 2. Again, the clock was ticking. But aside from hardware, the Dreamcast had an even bigger problem, a lack of games. When it launched, Sonic Adventure wasn't ready yet, and out of the Dreamcast's four launch titles, only Virtua Fighter 3 was popular. To add insult to injury, there were even reports of disappointed Japanese gamers returning their Dreamcasts and using the money to buy PlayStation games. Sega responded by appealing to gamers' wallets. They cut the price to 19,000 yen. That move made the hardware unprofitable, but the price cut, along with the release of Soul Calibur, helped give the Dreamcast a much, much needed boost in Japan. Then, Sega turned its attention to the US, building up a base of launch games and focusing on one of its strengths, marketing. Like it did with previous consoles, Sega launched an innovative marketing campaign that emphasized the Dreamcast's superior hardware. You might remember the It's Thinking ads, which were only 15 seconds long and gave the Dreamcast a mysterious air. The ads also had a futuristic vibe, almost reminiscent of the Matrix that made the Dreamcast look like the cool new system of the future. Peter Moore, at the time the president of Sega of America, described the strategy this way to Gama Sutra. We tried to catapult gamers into thinking that this was going to be a new level of artificial intelligence, a new level of hardware power, and would generate games that were really different than what you were seeing on the PlayStation or the Nintendo 64. To help sell the Dreamcast, Sega mended fences with North American retailers and worked with them to sell Dreamcast pre-orders to the public. The idea of pre-ordering a console so you'd be guaranteed one on launch day was a relatively new one, and it caught on. It worked, and 300,000 Dreamcasts were pre-sold in the US before it launched on September 9th, 1999, or 9999. But just before the Dreamcast launched in America, Stoller was fired after a disagreement with upper management. He told G4TV that it was unfortunate, but the team that I had built and the team that had really helped build the launch, they were in place. They were ready to go. Finally, the Dreamcast arrived in America. Graphically, it smoked its competitors and it had a stout lineup of games that included Soul Calibur, NFL 2K, and Sonic Adventure, among others. And people ate it up. The Dreamcast sold 372,000 units in four days, and it landed in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most advanced games console. Two weeks after its launch in North America, Sega said it had sold more than half a million units, a feat that took the PlayStation four months to achieve. The moment belonged to Sega, but it wouldn't last. No one at the company knew it, but the Dreamcast would be dead in less than two years. But for the moment, the system was riding high. Games that are now legendary, like Jet Set Radio and Shenmue came out on the system, along with Skies of Arcadia, Fantasy Star Online, Crazy Taxi, Rez, Space Channel 5, and dozens more. As games journalist Henry Gilbert wrote in Games Radar, Sega always had great internal development teams for its consoles, but the game makers had really matured by the time the Dreamcast arrived. The Dreamcast fast became a home to creative first-party titles, all beautifully executed by their respective developers. A variety of developers like Acclaim, Ubisoft, Midway, Activision, and Capcom all developed games for the Dreamcast, ranging from originals to ports of PlayStation, PC, and even arcade games. Charles Belfield, director of marketing for Sega of America, told Gama Sutra that companies like Ubisoft, in my perception at the time, were created on Dreamcast. Companies like Acclaim survived a lot longer because of Dreamcast. Activision as well. Capcom was hugely successful on the platform. The first year, we were widely and successfully supported. Sega was riding high. At the end of 1999, Dreamcast sales exceeded 1.5 million in North America. But still, Sony controlled over 60% of the overall video game market in North America with the PlayStation. And then the hammer dropped. On March 4, 2000, Sony released the PlayStation 2 worldwide, and almost immediately, despite having an inferior lineup of games and a limited supply of hardware, it started kicking the shit out of the Dreamcast. 
The PlayStation 2's success was no secret formula. It was riding the strength of the brand established by the wildly popular original PlayStation. Plus, it featured backwards compatibility, and it could play DVDs, which attracted a whole new audience who wanted a low-cost option for a standalone DVD player. Sales of the PS2, along with games and accessories, pulled in $250 million on the first day, shattering the $97 million mark set by the Dreamcast. After one day in Japan, the PlayStation 2 had sold almost a million units. The Dreamcast sales plummeted almost immediately. To fight back, Sega launched its online service, SegaNet, in September of 2000 and gave all its Japanese players a free year of access. Sega had one last glimmer of hope. The PlayStation 2 suffered major supply shortages throughout 2000, and Sega hoped that drought would send customers their way. In the States, Sega cut the price of the Dreamcast to $150, and the company even offered a rebate for the full price of the console to any Dreamcast owner who bought an 18-month subscription to SegaNet. To remain viable, Sega officials said that the Dreamcast would need to sell 5 million units in the US by the end of the year 2000. That didn't happen, and the Dreamcast ended up only selling 3 million. Plus, all the price cuts and rebates caused big financial losses for Sega. In March of 2001, Sega posted a net loss of $417 million. By early 2001, Sega was bleeding money, and rumors were rampant that it was going to get out of the console business. Sega officials tried to fend off the rumors. We totally, utterly confirm our commitment to the Dreamcast technology and platform, Charles Belfield, Sega of America's director of marketing, told the LA Times on January 24, 2001. Just seven days after Belfield made that statement, Sega announced that it was pulling the plug on the Dreamcast and would restructure the company to become a third-party publisher instead. Sega hasn't produced a console since. In all, about 9.1 million Dreamcasts were sold worldwide. In the end, the Dreamcast didn't even sell as well as the Saturn. It was a sad ending to a console that so many believed was ahead of its time. So why did the Dreamcast die? Well, it, it depends on who you ask. Experts point to everything from a lack of third-party support from companies like EA, larger financial woes at Sega, and even a weirdly large controller that didn't have a second analog stick. People also point to the Dreamcast's delayed launch outside Japan, which didn't give it enough time to build a firewall against the PlayStation 2. As Belfield put it to Gamasutra, we had the content right, we had the marketing right, the product was designed right, the philosophy of networked capabilities was right, the team was right, the partners we had were right, but we didn't have the budget to be able to build the confidence of the brand in the eyes of our competitors that we were going to be around. That, to me, is the Achilles heel of the Dreamcast. Veteran games journalist Sam Kennedy said, The forces were simply against Sega. EA not developing on the platform surely had some impact, but the simple fact that Microsoft had intentions to enter the console space made it clear that it would be a brutal, costly battle for Sega to stay involved. Sega veteran Tadashi Takazaki told Polygon, In essence, it was a pure matter of cost. It was because we were forced into a discount war when we were already losing money on system sales. Sony was part of the team that developed the DVD standard, and they could develop a system around that completely internally with their own chips. Sega, meanwhile, was buying everything from outside companies, so it was at a distinct cost advantage. Sega would go on to become a third-party publisher, making games like Panzer Dragoon, Virtua Fighter, and more for its former rivals. But to this day, there are still fond memories of the Dreamcast as a console that was ahead of its time, but never managed to escape the shadow of its much larger competitors. There is still an active community that continues to make games for the Dreamcast. At least 36 new games have been made since 2003, and Kickstarter campaigns are still popping up for new games. Even in 2017, the memories of the Dreamcast have only gotten fonder for some. But why has the Dreamcast retained such a cult following? Why do people love it so much? Deki Koss, a game designer from the Bronx, explained it this way to Fusion. I think people are so fond of the Dreamcast because it managed to be both charmingly quirky and a heavyweight contender. 
I think the most ambitious projects were the products of people who never played it safe. Nothing was too out there for them, as long as it was playful and memorable. Games writer Henry Gilbert summed up the Dreamcast this way in Games Radar. Some gamers look at the Dreamcast as a cautionary tale, a warning to today's current console makers, but that's not really accurate. After numerous mistakes preceded the Dreamcast, it was the system that Sega finally got right, from hardware to software to marketing. It just came too late. However, the Dreamcast was Sega leaving the console race on its own terms, with its head held high because it had one of the strongest runs of any system ever. No poor sales reports can take that away.